There you go, broadcast is live. Hello, welcome to the Egg on Air Live Fireside Chat on Supply Chain Disruption. I'm Alexis Fournier, Director of AI Strategy at Dateku, and I'm really happy to have with me today Arnold Libenag. We will discuss uh, the global health crisis and how it has accelerated the adoption of AI and help organizations drive efficiency through the use of AI at scale in production settings. With more than 20 years of experience in tech and strategy consulting, Arnold is currently the CTO of Ivado Labs. Ivado Labs is one of the Canadian leading AI consulting firm cons focusing on supply chain solutions. Before joining this company, Arnold, Arnold led the AI strategy and transformation practice at PwC Canada. Arnold, welcome with us. Thank you for being here with us today. Can you please uh, introduce a little more yourself and Eva the Labs company, please? Yeah, no, sure. Thank you for having me today. It's uh, really great to be able to talk about what uh, you know we've been doing in the uh, supply chain AI space. Um, so Eva the Labs, uh, like you said, is a, a consulting shop focused on AI in supply chain. Uh, we're fairly new to the uh, field, uh, you know, uh, 18, uh, two and a half years old. Uh, but since then, um, we've been quite successful and, and lucky in terms of, uh, you know, making a, a mark in the Canadian marketplace, uh, developing these custom solutions. Uh, Evado Labs was built uh, with the foundation of uh, the a set of professors in Montreal, uh, with Montreal being one of the global AI hubs. And so using that uh, intellectual capital, we uh, surrounded them with uh, professionals in terms of uh, consultants, engineers, and uh, data scientists to extract that information from them and, and facilitate the transfer of knowledge from academia uh, to industry. And so that's been our primary mission. And so far, uh, we've been uh, having good success uh, in the market today. Really happy to hear about that. And what about you? I mean, uh, in your past experience, so I've heard that you were working in a supply chain strategy and tech also in, in the past 20 years. So maybe a little bit more on your side. Yeah, so uh, like you said before this, I was uh, a leader in the uh, AI team at uh, PwC Canada, where uh, you know I really got exposed to helping develop uh, not only AI strategies, but technology strategies in general uh, okay. with many leading companies here uh, and globally. But before that, I was uh, working at uh, EDS, uh, who got out bought, bought out by HP um, for about 10 years. And that's where I was doing large scale outsourcing. So that's where I got my chops in terms of, uh, you know, some real good technology background and understanding for large scale implementations. You know, we were doing many uh, billion dollar type deals uh, in terms of outsourcing. So that's uh, that was a really interesting exercise. And then about 20 years ago, uh, I was lucky enough to have studied under one of Jeff Hinton's uh, early students uh, doing neural networks when okay. I was doing so my graduate kind of, studies. Uh, yeah, <laughs> at the root of the neural network. Okay, it was good. a small community way back then. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's go back to, let's say, the supply chain disruption subject of today. Um, so thank you for the introduction of Ivalo Lab and, and you. Uh, I, I think it might be really interesting to see how Actually, your actual company, Vado Labs, has been kind of a major player in the supply chain uh, since years. Um, with this expertise, all the different maybe subjects or projects and customer you've seen uh, uh, in the past years. Um, can you maybe explain to our audience which major trends or changes you've been facing in the past years um, not specifically we are we all know that we are in a specific situation today so mm -hmm. not specific to the covid situation we are facing today but more what was already taking place on on let's say on the supply chain area so do you have any feedback or things on that yeah so i mean uh, before uh, covid hit uh, ai was already a, a top item agenda in the c suite um, and this was driven by uh, a number of factors uh, that were evolving over time for the last, I would say, easily five to 10 years. Um, and so there's been a steady progression in terms of uh, major trends in supply chain 
and technology transformation overall uh, in the space. Uh, you know, the ones that really come to mind or, or, or the ones that we're, I can highlight now are obviously digitization. And that's just a broad based uh, trend, but within supply chain, it's been really picking up recently. And so that's been affecting our space. And, and, and as we work with clients, that's obviously a, a very foundational element to making AI successful uh, and, and business innovation in general. So things like e-commerce, uh, the acceleration and adoption of e-commerce, uh, the idea of hyper-personalization, uh, single day shipping or two day, one day shipping. And then even the idea of shorter product cycles as we are seeing with fast fashion and, and many other things, uh, that definitely has impacted how the supply chain is configured, the velocity of, uh, you know, the increased velocity of, of goods through the supply chain, and honestly, the amount of variety of goods that are flowing through supply chain. So these are challenges that a lot of our clients were experiencing already pre-COVID, and, and we could see those trends picking up. Um, and then just other general trends that we're, we're seeing that, uh, you know, were key items on the top of our client's mind were, you know, macro events, obviously pandemics being one, but economic cycles, you know, 2008 was a big thing um, in terms of how the, the housing crisis affected uh, supply chains globally. And, and also how uh, globalization is affecting the marketplace as well and shifting labor pools. So what that means is the source of the, the supply chain which is the manufacturing side, the input, uh, that actually is starting to move around, and then how do how do people deal with that as well? Oh, really interesting. And yeah. so, what what type of uh, technology you've been seeing in this kind of uh, uh, slowly moving trend, let's say, uh, um, around this let's trend or, or changes we've been seeing in in this, uh, as you've said, business innovation regarding e-commerce, maybe uh, uh, hyper personalization, as you said. We want that tomorrow. We want that to be. <laughs> only uh, uh, for me, so I want to maybe put uh, my logo on these shoes, etc. So all these type of things that in, in, involve a, a change in the supply chain. Have you seen, a, have you seen any uh, key enabling technology to actually deliver that to the customer or to the end user, let's say? Yeah, so obviously AI being our space, that's that's one of the key, key drivers. But uh, what's interesting is uh, AI is not only an enabler, but also a recipient of other enabling technology. So this is what we see as a confluence of technologies that are coming together okay. uh, that that uh, have these combinatorial innovation effects, right? So uh, the things that been uh, either we depend on or we feed in as an AI company are things like robotics. So robotics is definitely a, a major tech, tech trend uh, that's enabling a lot of these giant uh, or macro trends that are happening in the supply chain space. And what it does is obviously allow a, a, a higher level of automation that has not been achievable before. And so the advancements in robotics is, is definitely changing the landscape significantly. Uh, the other thing that um, we've seen uh, dramatically uh, in, you know, uh, transform how companies are able to use technology is edge computing plus 5G. And what that means is now there's increased or significant amount of visibility in terms of uh, what you can see in the supply chain and how goods are moving. So the ability to understand at the granular level, uh, you know, where your goods are at each point in the supply chain, um, at, 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 at a container level, or if, if potentially down to the pallet level. So, so that's really been uh, amazing. And, and from an AI perspective, um, what that does is it's essentially the eyes and ears for uh, the artificial intelligence and it's the sensory capability to be able to see what's happening and understand and, and feed that data in. And then the other part is, so once you're feeding that sensory information in, where does it go? Um, so big data has obviously been a, a topic for the last 10 years, but I think uh, its evolution is really uh, being uh, surfaced now. Uh, and, and it's, you know, you're seeing these step changes in, in that technology. And you know, with the evolution or with the emergence of uh, platforms like Palantir, uh, Snowflake, um, C3.ai, you know, these are interesting uh, propositions now that have not been available before that allow for um, really the large scale integration of data at speed. Uh, before these were $100 million projects uh, that took multi years. Now they're becoming um, you know, million dollar projects in that magnitude of order. And, and happen within the order of months. And uh, they tout sometimes weeks, 
Um, but you know, the magnitude of speed, the speed in which these are getting implemented is, is significantly faster these days. And so from an AI perspective, yeah. uh, that's critical. So, so now we're, our ability to access all that data is um, you know, significantly enhanced and uh, the friction to getting out that access to the data is, is massively reduced. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's as you've said, uh, I mean, the beginning, the start of the journey was already to maybe connect things, uh, get the data, and uh, so through edge computing, sensors, et cetera, et cetera, and put that in a kind of a data lake or whatever exactly. thing we put on top of that. So now it's a phase of actually uh, uh, analyzing all this data to, to get a, a good output of that. So, and, and so have you seen kind of a during, we are all facing since one year, let's say, uh, almost uh, a crisis uh, with the COVID uh, situation. Um, so as we've said, as you've said just before, there were already underlying things, but uh, but now that we have been all hidden, let's say, by this uh, COVID situation, uh, have you seen uh, kind of how it has impact uh, specific transformation journey, or have you seen a change or have you seen something specific or it's kind of business as usual in your <laughs> in the supply chain area or so uh, for sure there's obviously been massive change and um, we've seen uh, these uh, the covid uh, situation impact clients quite differently in in different situations and, and it's it's pretty marked in terms of how that's happened i would say the most uh, prominent uh, change that we've seen uh, uh, that uh, you know our clients are, are experiencing um, is that the the consumer behavior is definitely altered uh, and, and for obvious reasons um, what's interesting is is that it's been pushed to the uh, to the edges and what I say that is demand has been pushed to the edges so uh, you know some of our clients um, they've seen their demand drop significantly so one of our clients is Air Canada for example um, and so demand is is basically uh, dropped ninety seven percent to that yeah, order of magnitude. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of the spectrum, um, you know, there, there's others whose demand is is just exploded. And uh, another client of ours is is Roche. And so in that situation, their demand for their products, uh, they're one of the largest um, COVID nineteen testing uh, providers and manufacturers out there, is is significantly overscribed, oversubscribed. And so, so we're seeing uh, both sides of the effect uh, with our clients and, and are helping them uh, address that. Um, so, so what's interesting is, you know, yes, uh, this demand curve and this, is, this demand uh, profile has changed significantly. Um, when you're on one side, which is the depressed side, um, you know the the questions that are being asked are quite different than when you're on the other side, and so with ex with you know Air Canada for example, um, their mindset is of all all about partly how do I quickly react to this lower demand and and then better predict because their models were very tuned to a normal situation, yeah. and so that's not not here today, but their headspace is all about. Okay, uh, we understand that demand is, is temporary in terms of its current state. Uh, how do we uh, best sense when demand is going to change? And, and how do we understand that acceleration when, when uh, things start yeah, to turning be ready for the next step, let's say. Yeah, exactly. So that's where their headspace is. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, whereas on the other side, on, on the, when we're, for those whose demand has exploded, uh, for example, Roche, their headspace is all about, well, well how do we actually um, kind of throttle our, our supply chain such that everybody gets things fairly. I mean, that's the big question on their mind, right? So it's, it's very interesting to see those two sides of the spectrum. And do you have a kind of a, an example that you can share with, uh, with our audience on the maybe Roche or Port of Montreal where, where you've seen actually this shift between just before and after or, or after? And have you seen a change? And you, you express it a little bit, but can you maybe go a little bit more in detail or what was the usual, let's say, use cases or things you were doing uh, with Evado Labs? And, and, and after the situation, what are you doing? Uh, have you just stopped everything or changed? Mm -hmm. Or the use case is, as you've said, it's not the same thing? Or uh, So maybe you can share one or two examples of uh, yeah. this change in, in 
impacted by COVID, let's say. Absolutely. So Port of Montreal is a strategic client of ours, and we've been working with them for, for over a few uh, year now. And so before the pandemic, uh, we were very focused on, um, you know, optimizing their operations on the ground. So, so the terminal operations itself in terms of, uh, you know, the inputs and outputs. So the ability to coordinate uh, the movement of goods as uh, they come into the port from the rail side uh, and also coming in from the seaside and then the exchange of that in the port and then pushing it back out on, on both sides. So, so um, you know, they definitely were already marching down the digitization journey and, and applying technology to optimize how that's done because it was, you know, as, as many ports around the world still are, are there's various elements that are, that are driven by legacy processes. Yep. So we were updating that whole thing and adding AI to provide intelligence around that and being able to really efficiently move those goods through that, uh, th that point in the supply chain. What was interesting is when COVID came along, um, you know, that still was critical but now the idea was about um, you know, the acceleration of goods and specific goods, actually. Yeah, so, kind of a batch or a container is prioritary. Exactly. While before it was maybe more a kind of an optimization of all these different routes and, yes. and type of things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's what really came to the fore, and that that was the pivot. So uh, it was more like um, a, an augmentation or, or a slight uh, refocusing of what we were already doing. And then now it's all about how do we start prioritizing in, in that particular case was PPE. So, so those particular goods, even though they were labeled and people had an understanding of them, they were not all fully labeled. And to a certain extent, um, certain items like let's say hockey masks versus PPE yeah. masks, uh, they can get confused if you're just uh, broadly looking at just uh, text search or things like that. So, so we built some algorithms that were a little more intelligent in terms of distinguishing and really finding those items in, in the whole um, delivery of items that go th flow through the port. And so that was um, an interesting project that we were able to pivot, solve really quickly, uh, and then uh, return back to uh, the larger solution that we were talking to them about. So that was an interesting journey with them. And what I would say is, um, you know, uh, the pandemic, in terms of effects was rather swift, well, it was incredibly swift. Like uh, I think un unexpectedly in the order of weeks is when things had changed. Uh, demand had dropped in the order of weeks, people's lives have changed in the order of weeks. So the question a lot of our clients were coming to us with was, you know, um, we have this issue, we need to implement something now, we need to apply uh, AI so that we can react quickly. Our challenge, obviously, is we were building solutions and they take orders, you know, they take months sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. It, not in one day. Yeah. Not in one day. So, so luckily with Port of Montreal and some of our other clients, we'd already uh, been engaged with them and building these solutions and the AI solutions. So, our familiar with uh, the data and the landscape and the people allowed us to really um, accelerate the development of certain solutions. And when we had a good focus in terms of the uh, features and exactly the use case that we were developing, uh, we were able to build uh, meaningful solutions in the order of weeks. So with Port of Montreal, that was in the order of 10 weeks. We had something on the ground, people were using it, and yeah. now it's actually making a meaningful impact. Yeah, so so that's really interesting. I, I, I keep the word I uh, put on paper, uh, pivot. I think that's something, a really nice word. Uh, yeah. Even if I'm French and you can hear from my wonderful accent, so but I understand pivot and and uh, it, it's really interesting from before and pivot to something different but not completely different. But uh, uh, and that's because as you've said before, they were already in this initiative and they were already in this journey. Let's say uh, uh, regarding the use of data for their day-to-day business. Absolutely, um, a really interesting point, but. Um, this one, so you spoke about Roach, you spoke about Port of Montreal. Um, so this seems to be kind of mature, uh, digitally mature, let's say, or uh, and which leads to a kind of agility. And these pivot things in terms of weeks, mm -hmm. to be able uh, to go from a, a big demand to zero demand or the opposite or completely shift in the demand. So for me, that really uh, leads to kind of an agility. Um, and so do you have other kind of lesson learned or observation regarding, let's say, this agility. You, you took nice example here, but uh, maybe 
you can also see the other side. So, um, and, and do you have kind of few things on that? Um, yeah, so I mean, um, even, even though our clients had already uh, started that digital journey and had a level of maturity, there's obviously still things everybody's learning as they go along this path. Um, and so, you know, there, there are certain things that uh, we've seen and certain themes that have popped up in terms of, uh, particularly with AI, when uh, our clients encounter it, their, their mindset and, and sort of, um, I would say, uh, common pitfalls that uh, a lot of people who are first uh, going into the AI space and trying out AI, uh, we've seen these common pitfalls in terms of uh, mindset or how they think and, and how projects are executed. And I think they kind of fall into three big buckets that we've seen okay. um, and from a practical perspective. So the one I would say is uh, jumping to the solution first. And this is largely due to, I would say, the media and the press and, and how AI has been hyped so you know a lot in 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 general press and so when they come and call come calling to us uh they already have to a certain extent uh, you know um an idea of what the solution yeah. should be <laughs> and so we have to repivot them and 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 tell the clients and and, and our partners and uh, you know in terms of you know let's start with the business and and what is the problem and so and what Evato labs yeah. yes and at Evato labs um and luckily we have this mindset and our professors already uh, are tuned to uh, approaching problems this way is that uh, they re we really focus heavily on shaping that problem correctly. Yeah. Um, because what's interesting is, um, you know, when you look at a problem, uh, often from a business lens, it's it's holistic in sense. So what we do is uh, decompose that problem into a set of tasks and we can almost reconfigure it such that it can be uh, cast into, into a computation or an algorithmic viewpoint. Yeah, okay. And so there are a set of decisions that need to be made and each decision has an input output and then that input feeds the next uh, decision to uh, and so on and so so forth. So when we break it down like that, uh, then you actually start seeing uh, the interesting elements around, you know, where can AI really add value? Mm -hmm. uh, where is AI mature enough to add value? And beyond that, where actually is it great for people to continue to own, right? Because uh, some some people think AI it's uh, a binary decision in terms of all or none, whereas uh, the majority of our solutions are actually very much human in the loop, and we okay. feel that uh, that's a very critical element to success. So that's one big area. Yeah. So the second one is uh, so don't don't come with your uh, uh, ID with a fixed ID. That's the first one. Absolutely. So the second one kind of pitfall. Yeah. Yeah, second pitfall, and this is, so that's at the beginning of the projects. Uh, the second pitfall we see during a project, so as we're engaged and, and everybody's bought in and, and we're deep into the engagement, um, what we find interesting is uh, people expect perfection from AI, even though the current state is far from perfect. So mm -hmm. that has been very interesting. Um, you it's know, about just, expectation, expectation and, and, and reality. So Absolutely, right? Yeah. So. When a person's doing the job, everybody's like, oh, there's mistakes, this happened, that happened. So we talk to them and then we get it rectified. When an AI is doing the job, if it makes one mistake in 10,000, <laughs> then they're like, oh, this thing is not working. <laughs> like, what's wrong with it? So, so that, that's that's everything around the kind of, a, and you've said it during the first point, which is a, laid by uh, the market, the press, et cetera. I mean, the marketing buzz, uh, which leads to a, a lack of awareness or, or reality. Uh, yes. Kind of. So okay, that's uh, and, and also during the project, you, you see that. Yes. Are, are, okay. It's it's about trust also, or no, trust is a big thing. Okay. And so the way we um, deal with that is involving the users early. Um, okay. Putting, encouraging, uh, and and setting the 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 expectation around uh, experimentation, the idea of experimentation. Okay. So you know. Um, even ourselves, when we come into uh, when we come to the table with respect to how we're going to solve this problem, uh, we phrase them and we 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 uh, talk about our solutions as hypotheses, right? Because that's what they are to start with, and then we test them and then we whittle it down to something that makes sense and then move forward with the high probability option. Like that's that's the way we that's the terms we use. That's the mindset we have instead of uh, being definitive, right? Because it is all, all about experimentation. And that's a very important kind of thing to think okay, about. Okay, good, really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then finally, I would say the last one, 
on the after end. So we've we've gone through this journey and implemented. Um, you know, we're actually seeing a lot of interesting uh, challenges around measuring the value okay. of, mm. of the AI. It's not always trivial um, because you know Google, Amazon, Netflix, uh, they have all the um, benefits of working in a 100% digital environment. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if they can do A/B testing to know mm -hmm. tomorrow. We work in the physical environment, yeah. and A/B yeah. testing is not realistic in all, every scenario. So yeah, so, and there is a, a, an education or an awareness that is completely different with the one the company you've just mentioned, get Google, Facebook, etc. And it's, yes. uh, while supply chain has been here for uh, not decade but more. So so okay. So Absolutely. so fit so, in three things: just the before kind of expectation, yeah. just the. Uh, uh, during also expectation or, or face to the reality yep. and the after okay uh, you need to to kind of give the value of what has been done since weeks or months uh is it for budget purpose or is it for trust or is it for is it for i mean for everything also or? yeah yeah well i think it's trust and then also um to overcome the idea you know to really prove out that uh you know there is a, a delta change in terms of applying yeah. this technology because it is disruptive, right? And and what's important is, um, you know, when you when our clients start down this AI journey, um, there is a significant investment that needs to happen up front, and and so that investment is not only in the capital around the project itself, but also in the level of transformation within the organization. Yeah. So people have themselves have to understand the AI, have to understand how to work with AI. And that includes change management and process change, and those are uh, you know significant investments. So therefore, proving the value is critical to yeah to, to, to lead to the change. Yeah, yeah. help the, the executives are sweating, so <laughs> you, you need to give them the towel to kind of wipe that sweat off, and that's what that is for. I understand. Yeah. 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 Okay, so that's good. So so it was uh, yes related to this kind of a uh, uh, main problem you've seen. Uh, uh, when you start a project or where you, when you do have an ID. Uh, uh, okay, this is uh, around that. So I, I do have also, um, have you seen a, a specific uh, gap maybe between uh, what we can call the, the, the first and, and the second type of role? Or have you seen a, a difference with this COVID situation uh, between people that were already, let's say, in this digital world and the others, or, or for you, it has not changed so much. So just no, definitely. I would, yeah. So I would say, um, you know, and McKinsey had a great report on this in terms of, you know, how AI um, laggards versus leaders, uh, mm -hmm. and the effect that will have to their business. Um, you know, uh, it was clear that uh, the laggards would definitely lose out. So you can't be a fast follower or, or follower in this sense. Um, but what COVID has done is really widened that gap and highlighted uh, okay. who's yeah. able to take advantage and who can't. Yeah. And uh, I think what's happening is, um, you know, those laggards are falling further and further behind faster, uh, uh, you know, because the ones who are digitally even slightly mature and invested in already pre-COVID uh, are starting to feel the, the benefits and realize yeah. those benefits quickly. And that flywheel is happening really fast yeah. right now. Yeah, it's accelerated the whole thing, so. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's what we've seen uh, also uh, with our customer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we are almost at the end of this uh, um, session today with you. Um, it, it's really interesting, but I, I do have maybe a, uh, another question for, for the next step, let's say, for, yeah. for the future. Uh, I know you don't have this uh, crystal ball. I don't either. But uh, uh, maybe if you, if you can think about coming years, if you can think about uh, what you are doing already with your uh, customer and pro and all the projects you've been doing uh, the last 20 years, let's say. Um, do you have any specific advice on, on on what the customer need to start with, or 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 I mean, you've said already for this pitfall type of uh, um, don't come with a fixed ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But maybe have you do you have something in mind just to uh, achieve this vision? Um, I want to be an AI company. I want to be a data driven company. So. What, what are the main things they need to think about today? Do you think that are important, even if it's to realize the value in two or three years, but mm -hmm. that are really important basis. You, you spoke a little bit about the human-centric things. 
Uh, I think it's really important, but maybe you do have other, uh, uh, other things. Yeah, so I mean, aside from the whole digital journey and things like that, that's the foundation. So that's an essential. But right. let's just assume that uh, that's been at least thought of and, and there's something there. Moving next to how do I uh, leverage that data and become more AI uh, centric? Uh, I would say, you know, there's three kind of broad steps uh, a lot of companies can start doing that will help them accelerate that journey. And uh, number one would be to incrementally build your AI strategy. And when I say incremental, I mean, you know, I, I come from a strategy firm and, you know, uh, I've worked with many. And the typical approach to strategy is a three to five year roadmap. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a roughly a six month exercise to kind of build all that. So you're doing a broad based enterprise wide strategy. What we've seen successful with respect to AI is because it's a fast moving industry in terms of the technology, new uh, findings are always coming out, new new discoveries. Um, and, and, the, and the technology landscape is changing so quickly. Uh, what we do is build strategies. What we've seen successful is strategies for uh, focused areas of the business. So either it be um, you know a particular major process within the uh, within the organization, like order to cash, for example, mm -hmm. or a business unit in itself. So okay. if you build a strategy around that, decompose uh, kind of key elements and find a bundle of use cases within that domain area of the business, uh, we find that that's something tangible and can be done in the order of like uh, four to six weeks, and that's uh, that's a very nice turnaround. And so. So I think that's that's one of the critical elements there is is organize your ideas in, in a very finite part of the business so that you can see you know a a small roadmap of, of things to do, and once that's done, I would say execute the right pile of projects. So being a consultant, everything that falls to the top right, <laughs> you know, high value, high high feasibility, yeah, uh, go go for those. Um, obviously, with the ones that can be implemented within a short time frame. And that you have the right uh, executive sponsorship. So, so pick those ones that uh, essentially the low hanging fruit. Get those off the ground, um, and and use that as your platform to then get justification for moving ahead with other pilot projects. And then the last one is uh, building the AI capability. And so this means many things. Uh, I think a lot of our clients immediately gravitate towards I'm going to build a data science team. That's one way to do it, and that's one aspect of a capability. But what we found really beneficial, uh, that's driven a ton of value, is even, uh, let's just say, oddly enough, if I may say, is if your legal team is actually up to speed on AI. Okay. And what does that mean is how do, the, how do they understand the rights around data, uh, the governance around data, the risks around that, and the sharing of data. So now you're creating new contracts with other people to share data and the outputs of your AI and the IP around that you're creating around your AI. So that's one. And then your business people as well. Obviously, how do they recast uh, the work that they do, the processes that they've designed um, and the way they work around an automated kind of uh, intelligent automated environment? I think those are the critical things that we've seen. Uh, just as important as building your data science team is your AI, um, your, your AI sort of versatility and knowledge uh, uh, in those different areas of the business is critical to success. Okay, thank you, Arnold. I mean, it's uh, we are almost uh, at the end of this session. I think we are at the end of the, I, I mean, this chat between you and me, this fire okay. side chat, chat uh, with no fire actually, but uh, <laughs> um, let's open up for questions from the audience if we do have. Uh, it was uh, on my side really interesting. So I hope we, we might have questions on the chat. Uh, I don't know. It works. Maybe we're gonna Is see it on the comments. Yeah. Uh, it's maybe in the comments. Oh yes, we do have things in the comments. Okay. Uh, tuck, tuck, tuck. Yeah, I do have one uh, one interesting question because uh, do you see all the issue we're mentioning? So everything from organization or or data maturity, etc. Only because we were focusing on supply chain here. Do you mm -hmm. see that? Only on manufacturing and supply chain company, or can it be wider, like for CPG, pharma, whatever? I mean, so what's interesting is the fact that we work in supply chain. Um, honestly, almost every company we've worked with, regardless of industry, has a supply chain of some sort. Okay, so it's <laughs> not specific. No, yes, I, 
yeah it's so so that's been interesting so that's why we just our, our entire world is uh, like it's i know it's a single lens but it kind of works in my in my world is that i see the entire world through the supply chain so whether it be people that we're moving bits that we're moving or physical goods um when you think about it that way uh it, it's been interesting but yes um let's just say uh these issues are, are quite broad so be, being the fact that you know, we, we deal with pharma, we've, de uh, we've been doing supply chain for healthcare, uh, we've been doing supply chain for even, uh, we've been talking to financial companies in terms of the movement of money and things like that. So, okay. so they do apply. Yeah, supply um, chain can be applied to everything, not only to goods, but to money and uh, yeah. It is a universal language right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Of something moving from one point to the other, uh, okay. physically or not. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, so yeah, I mean, the answer is there is no specific, uh, uh, let's say, industry really. Uh, yeah. Uh, problematic. I do have another question. Uh, do you foresee this shift in the supply chain trends that you were explaining at the beginning um, that were already pre-pandemic, let's say, uh, remaining post-pandemic? Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. I think I think um, you know that's that's an interesting question. I would say um, for sure the trends will continue, but um, the path out of the pandemic might be different, right? Okay. So the question becomes, um, is some of those trends uh, just gonna go at the same slope, if I may say, in terms of adoption, uh, but just uh, it's been interrupted? Or uh, will that slope change in other cases where the adoption, uh, the, the pandemic has sort of highlighted the deficiencies and mm -hmm. the gaps, and now people are really awakened to the idea and the adoption will accelerate because of the pandemic. And I, th I think there are a few elements, definitely, uh, and particularly uh, in my, in our space, uh, AI, that uh, slope is uh, actually a, a little bit up for sure. And then, have you seen slope going down? Actually, the slope going down. Um, you no, know, you know, maybe on technology we were all uh, dreaming of five years ago. I don't yeah. know. And actually, that seems to be not so much relevant anymore. I don't know. It's a uh, maybe it's it no. Yeah. Right now, no. I like. I could say, um, yeah. Uh, the ones that I, the ones that I, the areas that I've been in, everything is just uh, exploding in terms of adoption, yeah. right? So that's that's what I've seen. The ones that are going down, um, I guess, uh, off the top of my head, nothing particular pops to mind, but uh, yeah. Maybe you don't want to say. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, yeah, and also, <laughs> I want to be friendly to my colleagues and those other faces. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, so maybe I do have another question, and after we'll end up this session with you. Um, oh yeah, an interesting one. Uh, outside of this, uh, the different example you've mentioned before, um, what is typically the first use case you see in the supply chain organization they start with? So is it always kind of a transport type of things or, or or maybe a production if we speak about the supply chain as a global things or or maybe a supplier type of thing yeah so look at the end of the day um you know each client has their own um strengths and weaknesses so unfortunately it's not a, a common area it's not it's not something we see across all clients where they all say look this is where we're having problems and and let's yeah. focus here but um, what I can say is generally uh, where there's a gap in the market um, in terms of technology solutions uh, is on the pricing side, right? So, okay. um, you know, there's a lot of, I would say, demand forecasting. There's many companies who've been doing that for many years um, using whether it be AI or not, but statistical methods, uh, uh, analytic methods. So, so that's tried and I would say, uh, mature. But yeah. AI still can add value there for sure because yeah. now it can add it can it can use multiple factors to make those decisions versus single factor decisions. Yeah. Um, but the pricing definitely, I think, is uh, is ripe for um, uh, disruption, more disruption relative to other parts of the supply chain um, because uh, the approaches, the techniques, are much more uh, legacy driven. Um, and uh, the even though uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, studies around economic econometrics, that's a very hard word to say. Um, I know how to say that because I've, I'm an econometrician. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a lot around that. But I think uh, AI adds uh, a quite a different way of looking at pricing 
And so uh, if you apply uh, machine learning techniques with uh, traditional optimization techniques, uh, mm -hmm. I think there is a great place that a, a lot of disruption can happen. So that's more uh, the next step than what, yeah, more the next step of what a, what will be, let, let's say, the next big use case yeah. in this, this field. OK. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm looking if there was a question, but I think it's OK. I mean, if if someone from the audience want to ask one more, but uh, otherwise, I'm just checking. But I think it's OK. We are 40 minutes. Uh, uh, so I mean, it's perfect in terms of timing. Okay. Thank you, Arnold. I mean, it's uh, it was really, really interesting, at least on my side. I hope uh, the audience uh, also was interested by what we said. Um, Thank you again. Um, and maybe um, a last word on your side, or maybe not. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure participating in this. Yeah, you know, I think uh, AI and the, the pandemic. Um, we've been extremely privileged at at, at Evento Labs to be able to uh, not only be in the AI space, but to uh, I think uh, lately a few companies, particularly Roche, and we've also been working with uh, the government of Canada to um, you know, apply our knowledge to helping um, get yes. Canada yeah. out of this pandemic. I think for us, that's been a really rewarding experience. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, we're just, we're just happy to be part of the conversation. Okay, so thank yeah. you very much. Thank you to all uh, who join us live. I want to invite you um, to the next Egg on Air. So maybe uh, we can see the date uh, we do have two, um, one on December 10th and one on December 17th on two different subjects. Uh, and so I invite you to join us uh, egg on air. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, thank you, Arnold, again. Uh, thank you very much. Really interesting uh, session with you. I appreciate it. Thank you.